innovate, membership, partnership, agility, communicate, trust. That's impact. A 12-week intensive syllabus for innovative, industrious and inspiring association board leaders. Visit associationtransformation.org for more details and to register for our next programme. Cohorts commence in February, May and September 2021. Impact, a signature programme delivered in partnership by Consult Strategy and Brewer Pratt Solutions. Hello and welcome to Association Transformation, the weekly global podcast uh, brought to you by Consort Strategy and Brewer Pratt Solutions and in association with the Institute of Association Leadership. I am Andrew Chamberlain and of course, as, as always, joining me this week is my the inimitable, go for it. <laughs> Alisa Pratt. Thank you, Andrew. It's nice to be back. How are you this week? I'm very well. I'm excited. I'm optimistic in these, you know, first few weeks of the new year, and uh, excited to chat with uh, with some new association perspectives. Yes, and we absolutely are. Nice segue. It's like we rehearsed this. Um, <laughs> uh, regular listeners know that we've tended in the past to have transatlantic conversations for obvious reasons, because I'm here in the UK and Elisa is over in the US. Um, we are always, however, excited to broaden our horizons. And one of the objectives of the uh, Transformation podcast is to connect uh, listeners with expertise, knowledge and skills and experiences from across the world. And so this week, uh, I'm delighted that our focus is turning, well, uh, south to um, to the continent of Africa, and specifically with colleagues uh, joining us from South, south Africa. We have with us this week, Charlotte Kemp. Um, associations futurist. We have got to get into that one after I've made the introductions, by the way. Uh, and deputy president at the Professional Speakers Association of South Africa. We have Tess Proust, founder of Crystal Events Africa and president of the Society for Incentive Travel Excellence Africa and also chairperson at the South Africa Events Council. And finally, we have Kevin Jones, who is the executive director at the Southern African Communications Industries Association. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the pod. Yes, an accomplished group. Indeed. Very accomplished group. Indeed. I have to say, however, Tess, I'm looking at your Zoom background and I'm incentivized to go there. Where is it? Yeah. <laughs> this is a, sort of a bird's eye view of Cape Town with Robben Island in the front and Table Mountain, the city of Cape Town in the background. Fantastic. Good place to be. I love it. Yes, yeah, Andrew absolutely. and I are available for all. Andrew and I are available for all speaking engagements. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. If you're looking for honorary members for any association in South Africa, just give me a nod. Always, always happy to, to join. Um, <laughs> So uh, here we are, early works, early weeks of 2021. Um, I know that you guys in South Africa, much like well, like us in the UK, um, you're you're battling at the moment. Obviously, battling with um, the latest strains of of COVID, uh, and I know that um, you know it's it's deeply challenging for everybody, not just in the association sector, but uh, you know, in every industry, uh, it's a challenge. But uh, you know, I, I get a sense um, with the new strains, the new the new problems that are emerging for you guys in South Africa. This is a particularly challenging start to twenty twenty one. Is am I right, Charlotte? Yes, uh, absolutely. We were kind of hoping that. Uh, all of our government initiatives and good behaviour uh, would pay off, but we are certainly in our our second wave, and it's uh, it's pretty vicious. And uh, we had a couple of hot spots in the beginning of the uh, beginning of December of our kind of summer holidays, mm -hmm. and uh, it just got subsequently worse. So so we've gone back to our level three uh, kind of lockdown levels. Uh, you know, we're not kind of constrained at home, but, but it is very disappointing to kind of start off the year with these these problems. Yes. And a lot of people are thinking respondent. Yeah, yeah, you certainly get a sense of that with a lot of colleagues here as well. That we're kind of, I don't know why we thought that the first, you know, the 
a, a couple of weeks in, the, in in December and January, we're going to make everything all right again. So I think it is a challenge at the moment. And Tez, and, you know, you, you obviously are working, well, as all three of you do, you work, you know, Pan-Africa, not just in, in South Africa. Um, I don't re- I'm not really, forgive me, I'm not really fully up to speed in other uh, African nations as to, as to, as to, the problems that they suffer, uh, the extent of the problems that they're suffering. Is it, Tez, is it equally as bad in other African nations? Um, yes, yes and no. Um, you know, South Africa's probably been the worst hit as far as infections go. Um, whereas the rest of Africa, not so bad. Yet this past weekend, Zimbabwe has seen a complete uh, 30-day lockdown, back to level five for the next 30 days. Um, even though they only have a fraction of the infections that, that we see, but uh, that, that's certainly prudent of the government. Um, but, you know, one can't argue against those steps, except that the challenge is we're going back to, you know, zero economy. You know, if there's no yeah. trade, there's no business, there's no income, et cetera, et cetera, you know, the domino effect. Uh, whereas other countries in East Africa, um, they also see a slight rise in infections. I was in Rwanda just two weeks ago. So um, they, you know, it's, it's amazing how resilient the people are. The government says X and the, the nation listens. They say curfew, eight o'clock, you won't see a soul on the street except for emergency services. And they also have additional uh, quarantine um, requirements. Uh, you know, once you arrive in the country, 24 hours, another test. So they make sure that, that you're okay. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges we face, uh, not just in Africa, but across the world, is the alignment of protocols. Yeah. Um, and I think that's another topic. But, yeah, the, 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 there's different scenarios all over. But I think generally we are seeing an increase of infections across the continent. Well, and, and being a representative of the events industry, I, you know, a- Andrew mentioned the turning of the calendar hasn't given us any more clarity or certainty what uh how far out is the events industry paralyzed are our events you know i know here in the us people are already canceling their summer meetings um and i think we all thought this would be over by then um what is this doing in terms of travel and events in in your space you know for your association specifically right the um you know in terms of events and business uh travel specifically your mice events um our uh, optimistic picture is a slight return from Q3, maybe. At the current rate, we don't know. Because the one thing we have learned this past uh, year is that nothing is certain. It's, mm. it's impossible to plan. And the trust factor, I think, is, is, is massive. So until people are confident and the trust factor returns, yeah. it's, it's how long is a piece of string, to be honest. Uh, and Kevin, so, you know, I mean, uh, how are you grappling with that uncertainty like everybody else i suppose um absolutely like everybody else i think um you know i think one of the key questions that uh that we have as an association but i think it's something that Tess and charlotte would share is to stay uh you know how is uh, <laughs> you know when, when covid first came along we all kind of looked at what was happening in the market and we listened to what was happening in europe and we thought oh well you know Things will be tough for a couple of months, but then things will go back to normal. Well, you know, a couple of months progressed from three to six to nine, um, and, and now we're kind of well into 2021, uh, and and there is no clear picture of what's going to be happening. Uh, you know, we're planning events uh, to take place during uh, 2021. In fact, uh, we we ran during the last. Uh, during late December, we ran a training course in Swaziland uh, because there was a short break when uh, when uh, when right. training programs were, were allowed to happen again. Um, but the reality is that we're all stuck in a state of uncertainty, not just in South Africa, throughout the world, mm. um, and nobody has any clue what's what's uh, you know when we're going to be able to go back to to fulfilling our mandate, to serving our members, to, to making a contribution to the to the broader society that we live in. And it's a major challenge for us. Uh, you know, I, I know when I speak to my association colleagues around the world, we, like they, have had to lay off a certain number of our full-time staff. We need to mm-hmm. shrink, you know, we need to shrink down uh, in terms of our operating capacity. 
uh, but the demands that have been placed upon us as associations have increased. Uh, we found a situation where where government departments come to us as acknowledged industry experts, mm -hmm. and they say to us, what can you do as an association to help us address the challenges that we're facing? Um, so, you know, we put together, for example, the, um, uh, as you said earlier, Tess currently chairs the, uh, the events council. We put together uh, the event reopening guideline uh, that was published by SACIA in partnership with the uh, events council. And in order to do so, we work very closely with colleagues around the world, uh, particularly with the Event Safety Alliance, which is based in the US in, um, in, uh, in Philadelphia. And, um, uh, but, you know, the, the reality is that I think everybody's looking at this saying, uh, at, until we know the vaccine is, is available, I don't think we're going to be able to run big events. Uh, you know, we're, we're in a situation where our, our current lockdown regulations allow 100 people at an indoor event maximum, subject to 50% capacity, 250 people at an outdoor event, again, subject to 50% capacity. The reality is that big event organizers can't sustain themselves on that kind of volume. Um, and so uh, whether it's business events, whether it's music concerts, whether it's festivals, uh, you know, sporting events, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how does, a, how does a football team or a rugby team or a cricket team, you know, how do they make money when they can't sell tickets to their, uh, to their events? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so at almost every level that we engage in, our members are, are, are. It's not just that our members are saying, you know, how can we, how can we sustain ourselves going forward? It's actually how how can we survive? Uh, and that, that's a great deal of despondency. That's the the uh, I don't know the the juxtaposition that you know to your point, Kevin. Associations' opportunities to be valuable, opportunities to be relevant, are greater than ever. They're more mm -hmm. in need. What they're delivering in terms of service and value is is potentially greater than ever. And yet, because of the member situations or the delivery channels that they've used, they can't seem to bring that full circle, and will yep. will likely have greater loss in 2021 than they had in 2020. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't think associations have really felt the pain yet um, because the members are still going through those those transitions. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. But I think in an African context, you know, I got a real I mean, I've done a few uh, a few jobs in South Africa. And I've also done some work in Rwanda and, and Kenya. And, and I get a sense that the association sector is, uh, you know, as a community, as a sector, as an industry, has been really on the up in the last sort of. Uh, five years, particularly, you've seen a real ascent in terms of people's understanding, value, appreciation of their associations. And it feels like, um, well, and uh, for you more than for me, obviously, but it feels like such a massive slap in the face. And like all this hard work we've been doing, and I know that organizations like the um, African Society of Association Execs, but also the Association of Association Executives have, have has done some work uh, in pulling together, you know, the community um, in in particularly in Southern Africa. But uh, I, I worry that am I being over dramatic to suggest that this is actually this is not just significant, but this is really um, oh, what's what's the? I mean, it's seismic. This could have. Yeah. This, is this, could have implementation, implement, this could have implications for decades yeah. um, for all associations yeah. between the, the use of reserves, between the loss of, of talent and people between. I mean, this is a seismic shift in the wrong direction, unfortunately, that we're we're not in control of. But but we have a futurist on on with us. So, you know, maybe Charlotte uh, can help us uh, read the tea leaves. Uh, right. Not to put her on the spot, but it, it's in her uh, it's in her job description, I guess you can say. Read so the what's tea the... leaves. Read the tea leaves. That's not what you do, is it? Tell me that you haven't you haven't you not you haven't got a crystal ball as well. <laughs> no, no. Uh, crystal balls are not allowed in my association, um, my futures association. Yeah, so so what we look at is my own association is the Professional Speakers Association of Southern Africa, and, and I'll have to confess that we're actually doing very well. 
Um, but possibly because, first of all, we're, we're a very small association and we don't have any paid staff and we don't have huge overheads. And also we've been experimenting with online uh, tools and techniques and connections for, for a number of years. So we started inviting people uh, to come and speak to our meetings, uh, our chapter meetings via Skype <laughs> um, over five years ago. So we started practicing practicing hybrid events, saying to our members uh, that they needed to. So we were teaching our members how to be flexible and responsive to changes uh, that we were experiencing uh, from the conference industry. And that, I think, has put us into a, a good position. My work as a futurist means that I teach people how to cope with the whole uh, VUCA experience that we have. So VUCA is a lovely acronym that we use to talk about volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And when I speak to associations, it's, it's about exactly that. Uh, you know, how do you create a strategy? How do you make plans in a world where there is so much complexity and uncertainty? And part of it is just having these kinds of conversations, expressing our frustration and our confusion and our insecurity, and then still trying to find ways to, to pull our association members together to create something. That is really powerful. One of the values in our association is uh, we call we call it we use hashtags because we're trying to be modern. Um, but it's a hashtag co-create amazing. So whenever we post something online uh, on social media, whenever we talk about it, we got uh, four values. But whenever we we make decisions, we run them past those values, and some of them um, the, the the decisions have to be kind of in, in congruity with those values, uh, congruous with those values. So. If we, if we pull together, we can co-create amazing opportunities. Uh, when, you know, and, and that's kind of like the, the whole essence of what an association is. There's peers coming together to define, to create, to, to intentionally influence their industry. And, and that's what we're doing within the Professional Speakers Association. That's what we're doing with the Events Council as well, is coming together and collaborating and defining how uh, we can go, how we can still be in business, how we can still be relevant in the future as long as we're working together. Well, you know, I, this is what I think Andrew and I are hearing more and more often is those like you, Charlotte, that had structure and had principles and were, were already taking risks. This has become an opportunity to accelerate. And yeah. this has allowed you to almost force, you know, force additional innovations and, and fast track some of those things that you had already planted seeds for. Of course, that doesn't help the associations that weren't already in that, in that motion and into that direction. But I think those that were strong are becoming stronger. And, uh, and it's really what, what systems others can learn from and try to put in place in an, in an emergency capacity. Um, because there, there just isn't time and resources, but having that low overhead, I'm sure was very, very, very helpful going into this. Yeah. You need to be flexible and responsive, I think is the main thing. And, and there's a lot of associations that, um, that are a little bit more kind of stuck and unable to respond that way. And those are the ones that, that are having a problem at the moment. Tess, what were you going to say? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, fine. Um, I'm, I just want to add to to what Charlotte is saying. Um, I think first, let me explain to those who are not familiar with SITE how we work. Um, it's actually a, a global association based in Chicago, and Africa is a chapter. Mm -hmm. um, originally, we were South Africa, then Southern Africa, and last year, well, in fact, not last year, uh, late 2018, um, it was agreed that we can become an African chapter simply because anybody outside South Africa or Southern Africa who wanted to join had to join a Southern African chapter. And uh, there was a bit of a disconnect if you're either West African or East African because they didn't really feel part of their own chapter. So now we are one big family. Um, and I made a joke at the time, you know, how, how does one eat an elephant? And the answer is one bite at a time. So, um, you know, and, and shortly after we became uh, an African chapter, um, COVID hit and, and we got shut down. Um, very interesting to see, though, that we've actually had really good growth during this COVID period. Um, especially from East Africa. And, and that is one of the encouraging things that I've experienced is that people within our industry recognize the importance of honing your skills um, and staying current. Um, and that's why I was in Rwanda a couple of weeks ago is to do um, 
you know, face-to-face -face operational training for new DMCs because incentive travel is very new to them. But it's also kind of event management on steroids, which is really what an incentive program is. And, and it was amazing. The response that I got from all the attendees were phenomenal. And, and I still believe that there's an opportunity to generate new business within Africa, from Africa to Africa. Because the whole face of African business is changing. People are much more open-minded. Um, barriers are dropping. And there's a lot of opportunities, especially within the aviation sector, if it's approached correctly. We just had, a, I think it was on the 1st of January, the um, the African meeting for um, African free trade. And I think it's one of the most important initiatives in Africa. And we need to be following that. And, you know, I'm not saying jump on the bandwagon, but pay attention to where all the activity is happening. Because from a business point of view, after all, my business is economic drivers. And we need to know what's going on. I think there are great initiatives happening around the continent right now. But are we at risk that those great initiatives are just going to fall by the way if we don't have that clarity? Is that what you're suggesting? Um, not at all. Um, I, I think with the leadership we have in Africa right now driving it, um, mm -hmm. including Mr. Paul Kagame from, from Rwanda, Cyril mm -hmm. Ramaphosa, um, you know, there's always a matter of the succession plan. But I, I do believe that um, with our current leadership, they are moving in the right direction and nudging those countries that are still resisting um, to, to join forces. And, and hopefully that will have a positive uh, change on the African business landscape. And, and if I can just jump in there and, and, and carry this discussion about, you know, cooperation and collaboration a little forward. Uh, you know, our, our three associations are all part of a, of a kind of a collective that see us working together uh, in different areas. Um, but, but I think that the one thing that we all recognize is that we need to continue that cooperation and collaboration with international colleagues as well. Uh, you know, I don't, although we are all based in South Africa, the reality is that we see ourselves having a global footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, we see ourselves working with international colleagues in different parts of the world. Uh, the reality, particularly in the events industry, is that there are global standards mm. uh, on, on issues around technology and safety. And unless we engage with international colleagues and embrace those international standards, you know, we just become a, a silo of ineptitude. Uh, that's certainly not what we're trying to do. We want to be, uh, you know, we want to bring the world's best to, to whatever it is that we're doing with our associations in South Africa. Yeah. No, the world has gotten smaller during these probably last 12 months as we've all been trapped in our spaces, you know, with just the internet <clears throat> and a video, you know, a webcam to work with. And I know Andrew and I, as we've started to consult and help the Institute of Association Leadership, you know, the, the interest is in reaching out and finding the expertise and the best, you know, I don't like the word best practices, but the solutions that that others have have mastered um, in, in different in different parts. Associations aren't that much different, uh, no matter where where they're located. Yeah, no, no, I mean, that's absolutely right. I mean, I spend a lot of time working with associations on governance and the number of times I work, it doesn't matter where in the world I'm working with them, Australia, Canada, South Africa, every single one always tells me, ah, oh, yes, but we're unique. We're special <laughs> because, and yeah. I have to say to them, no, governance is governance is governance, wherever you are in the world. Uh, it's, your contexts are different, but actually, you know, leadership, um, governance strategy, leadership uh, in an association context is is universal. And I, 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 I am so pleased to hear you, what you're saying there, Kevin, about, as is, in my opinion, international collaboration um, is fundamental in, in, fundamental to all associations success, in my opinion. Um, and one of the positives, yeah, one of the positives I have seen come out of um, the last sort of 10 to 12 months is more progressive outreach, um, uh, you know, pan, well, I mean, look, I mean, this 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 podcast in itself is um, is an example of of um, transatlantic co uh, cooperation. So, you know, it it warms my heart when I hear people say, actually, we want to carry on doing this. You know, post post COVID, um, and particularly, you know, in, in the context of you know, as you said, standards. You know, and 
know, if we looked at something like 20, you know, ISO 2012-1, for example, and, you know, the sustainable events uh, standard, you know, I, I would love to see much more global collaboration around that standard uh, and the sharing of good practice and innovation uh, as it, as it's happening rather than presented as some kind of, well, this is a case study that happened 18, 24 months ago, or whatever. Go on, you were going to say, you were going to say something, Charlotte, sorry. Yeah, Andrew, thank you. I want to just kind of reinforce what you're saying about, you know, learning from people from other parts of the world. Uh, and we've done that a lot with our speakers. We've exposed them a lot to uh, speaking opportunities overseas or brought speakers from overseas to our events. And one of the things we've been trying to demonstrate is that um, the bigger kind of global picture you have in your mind about how things work, when you start talking to other people, you discover how something is different in another part of the world, but you still have the same problem, as you're saying. Mm, you know, mm -hmm. we, have, we have different problems, but we might have different ways of solving that problem. And, and by collaborating this way globally, we, we find innovative ways to bring a solution from a different association, a different industry, a different country to our part of the world, to our circle of influence. And that just enriches the, the leadership that we can offer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So with that in mind, I'd, I'd love to know, based on your, your lessons learned from 2020 or those collaborative uh, shares, wh what, are, what are you taking from 2020 that, that will help guide your, your strategy and your survival in 2021? I'd love to kind of hear from each of you that, that takeaway and that shaping your new direction. Tess, I'll, I'll start with Tess. You're at the top of my little uh, block of headshots. so. Okay, that, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, I think the one thing we've learned is that nothing is certain. So we need to be able to adapt every day. Because literally what is gospel today is old news tomorrow. And then, you know, pivot is the fabulous word that's come out of all of this. Um, but but we have to. And I just want to go back to, to what uh, both Kevin and, and Charlotte touched on. Um, you know, it goes back to collaboration. I, I think one of the greatest things that's come out of uh, this, this disaster is the power of collaboration. Um, we became the SA Events Council quite early on um, in the pandemic. And one of our key objectives is to lobby government, liaise with government, in fact, collaborate with government. Um, because we realized early on that there's a massive misunderstanding to what our industry is actually about. For instance, right in the beginning, we were pictured as the highest risk industry with the lowest contribution to the GDP. Whoa. <laughs> so we had to do some serious work to, to mm. get that perception to change. And it's, you know, we've had to chip away and we still keep chipping away. Um, but we've been fortunate that, you know, government eventually did sit up and listen, especially our Ministry of Tourism and, and Kevin's. Um, you know, Kevin and his team has had a, a huge amount of interaction with the um, Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, which is quite critical in, in their field. And uh, I, I do believe that we've made progress, albeit slow progress. But um, yeah, I think that's the, the power of collaboration and, you know, speaking in one united voice to, to help move things forward. Thank you. Kevin, how about you? So perhaps the most important lesson I think that we can take forward, stick to your knitting. Um, uh, you know, I think that when, when, when uh, membership is growing, when the economy is strong, you can experiment with all sorts of things outside of your uh, core mission statement. But when things get tough, if you don't stick to your knitting, if you don't have a clear picture of what it is that you're trying to achieve and you don't focus all of your energy uh, on on serving that core um, objective, it's very, very easy to, to find that you're just spending all of your time, energy and effort going down a path that is completely unrelated to where you want to be. Um, so stick to your knitting. Again, we speak about cooperation and collaboration, and I think that's one of the, the core issues uh, that's come out of the, of the event council that was established back in... Uh, back in March, uh, is that, you know, we have how many members test? 15 uh, 14. Odd? 14. 14. Uh, you know, actually each of us operates in, 
in a related field, but we operate completely independently of each other. The fact that we are able to share resources and cooperate and collaborate allows each of us to focus on those issues that are important to us and to our members, uh, but allows us as a collective uh, to stand up and express ourselves in a voice that is far more powerful than any one of us could achieve alone. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's that's been the case uh, locally in, in South Africa, but also internationally uh, within the framework of the co collaborative efforts. I said earlier that we developed uh, the event reopening guidelines that were uh, uh, adopted in, in South Africa, but we did so in partnership with the Event Safety Alliance in, in the US, with the VPLT in Germany, uh, with the Production Services Association and Plaza in the UK. Uh, you know, there was no one organization that was doing all of the work. It was a collaboration. And, and once we gathered input from all of those subject matter experts, we were able to go back, in our case, go back to government and say, you know, here's a document with, with clearly defined recommendations on how we can address the problems that we're experiencing both within our country and within our industry. Um, and, and, and it's not, you know, this is not a thumb suck recommendation. It's based on input from, from subject matter experts from around the world. So this, this whole issue of cooperation and collaboration uh, will fundamentally change the way I think that associations engage with their members and with each other going forward. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And Charlotte, you have both a, a micro and a macro perspective as an association leader, kind of in totality, what, what's your takeaway um, that's helping shape your, your direction for 2021? I think we've realized that it's easy to be an association leader in good times, um, but it takes some real skill and emotional intelligence and resilience to be a, a, a you know an association leader in tough times. And we're very lucky with our association uh, president, Joni Petty, uh, for the PSASA. Um, she really is an expert in EQ and, and resilience. So she's been teaching us all the way through the year how we, how we cope um, emotionally, mentally, physically, financially um, in our personal capacities and our business capacities and then also with the association. So I think one of the, the biggest takeaways is that, that flexibility that, that I mentioned earlier um, that our members, um, the associations that I see, the, the business leaders that I see who are able to be really flexible and responsive to situations, um, they found, a lot of them have found really great opportunities. And I'm not trying to, you know, I know a lot of businesses have really suffered. Uh, there are some businesses that just cannot survive during this time. So there's a lot of our members um, and, and our colleagues, members in the other um, SA events council associations who just probably may not survive, um, you know, the, the, the pandemic uh, in their business, right? But um, a lot of people have become a lot more uh, curious about those new opportunities that we find online. We're finding new marketplaces, new partnerships, new opportunities uh, to connect and collaborate around the world. So, you know, at least like you said, the world has become smaller, but we, we now have, you know, friends and colleagues in new markets that we didn't have before. And I think that is something that we want to press into this year is uh, to find out how to really make those worthwhile and pay off for us all uh, in, in different ways, and different experiences and, and maybe new business opportunities. That's, that's gosh, so true on, on so many levels. And uh, each of you, I, I took so many notes during this conversation and I really appreciate all, all three of your, your perspectives. There is so much to share and, and the power of collaboration really has, has shown itself to be one of the silver linings of this, this global pandemic. Um, on behalf of Andrew and myself, um, I want to thank both of you, or all three of you, Tess, Charlotte, and, and Kevin, for joining us this morning. It's a new year, and we're excited by the, the demonstrations of leadership in, in the association space, and you three are a great example of that. So thank you so much for your time and mm -hmm. uh, your contribution to this, this global conversation. Um, we at Association Transformation are excited to, uh, to be a part of the new year and, and broadcasting um, new solutions and new association innovations during this continued difficult time. Um, we hope you'll join us next time and every time for these transatlantic conversations and do hope that you've enjoyed today's podcast. If there's a subject you'd like us to explore, if you'd like to join us on the pod, you can tweet us at Association Transformation or email us at hello at yourconsort.com and we'll draw on our network. And those 
association leaders that we, we find uh, most curious and engaging, um, like our three today, to, uh, to pull together a podcast worth listening to. So until next time, stay well and put your members and your mission first. Association Transformation is brought to you in partnership between Consult Strategy and Brewer Pratt Solutions in support of the Institute of Association Leadership. We all know the challenges of being a board leader. COVID-19, recession, climate change, big data, the four day week, digital disruption, the gig economy. But what's the solution? IMPACT is a global board leaders network of volunteer association directors developed by and delivered through a transatlantic partnership between association specialists, Brewer Pratt Solutions and Consort Strategy. Intended to stimulate discussion and debate, educate, inspire and inform fresh approaches to governance leadership. To find out more, visit associationtransformation.com.